Welcome back to our third segment. I'm really excited to talk about this topic, Kathleen. It's been on the forefront of my mind ever since we figured out what was happening in Afghanistan. And when we saw the just shameful withdrawal, I think personally, of American troops mm -hmm. from um, if, and left, leaving people stranded. And I'd like to remind this people as we tape this right now, it is day 21 that we have left stranded behind Taliban lines. It's mm -hmm. Taliban lines yep. and they used to be the enemy and they still are in my mm -hmm. opinion. Taliban lines, uh, you know, thousands of, of Americans and uh, Afghani nationals who helped who secure, allies, yeah. uh, you know, victory over the Taliban in previous mm -hmm. times. So they're still in harm's way. The fight to keep them out, get them out is still an ongoing process. It has unfortunately sort of come to, to uh, a place where only the uh, American authorities have any ability to get folks out or to influence the Taliban. Mm -hmm. But that wasn't always the case. Uh, prior to that, you had a number of folks working independently on a, on the inside and on the outside coming together to free people from the tyranny that they see there. It was It's remarkable that this is also on the mind of a number of other people. The Wall Street Journal reporting in today's issue that after escaping Afghanistan, a family starts over in the U.S. And it talks about after fleeing Afghanistan, Mohammed and his six children landed in their new hometown on the day the capital city of Kabul fell to the Taliban, the family's fortuitous escape marked the start of another difficult journey. Um, you know, they sp Muhammad spent his first night in America in the emergency room in Virginia Hospital, struggling oh. to breathe. He was overcome with worry about his wife, his wife, mm -hmm. Aliyah, who was stopped from boarding their flight from mm -hmm. Kabul because of a visa problem. And the, the story goes on to talk about it. His wife was eventually released okay. by the Taliban, got one of those final flights out at the end of August to come here. But guess who's left behind? His brother is left behind. His brother, who is also These probably a target for the terrible. Taliban. Yeah. But we do know there's been a lot of uh, discussion and, uh, unfortunately, really good stories that came out about American soldiers, uh, American people, American not-for-profits right. who had come in contact with Afghanis and who have been trying to rescue them. So fortunately for us, here on the line with us is Esther Joy King. Esther is a JAG officer mm -hmm. in the U.S. Army Reserves. Interestingly, she spent time in Afghanistan. Uh, she was a humanitarian aid worker there. Uh, her mother and father started a school in Kabul mm -hmm. uh, the, it, for the last 13 years. And Esther actually got to go over there and teach uh, the students there. So she's got quite a few relationships there. And Esther is running for Congress in Good. Illinois, and we're mm -hmm. thrilled about that. So Esther, tell us more about your involvement in helping people in, at the, you know, in the throes of chaos at the end of August. How were you able to kind of secure the passage for some of these uh, folks fleeing for safe, to safety? Well, thank you for having me on, Jeannie, Kathleen. It's great to talk with you today. And I've you're not the first person to ask me that question. And I genuinely, all I can say is miracles and uh, WhatsApp. <laughs> Those were the tools that we used. Uh, it was an extraordinary experience. I actually, you're right that I had the opportunity to teach some of my parents' high school students. They run a, they, they're missionaries and they were there for missionary purposes and they ran a school in Kabul, Afghanistan for the last 13 years. And my mother actually was sick. And when she got sick, I took over my mom's high school English classes to be able to teach her students when she wasn't able to. And I built a strong relationship, especially with some of the girls in the, the high school. Mm -hmm. And so even, even before the fall of Kabul, I was trying to help knowing what was to come and knowing what a young woman would go through in that culture mm -hmm. if the Taliban were to take back over. I was already trying to help three young girls that mm -hmm. are 14, 15, and 15 to try and come get uh, study visas to come to a boarding school in the U.S. You did an interview with Barry Weiss on her podcast where you talk specifically about one girl. I believe her name is Rayma. Am I saying that right? Rahima. Rahima, who yeah. it took eight tries to get her and her family out was it eight seven seven yeah. tries to get her and her family yeah. before you got her out and it was just an absolutely harrowing story um when so what happened be august 14th i mean it, things had been escalating in that region for a while but 
the the world changed pretty rapidly between August 14th and August 15th. So what happened? Uh, what did you say to them? What did they say to you when you saw that that yeah. de-escalation of what was happening? Yeah. Well, I was. I'm certainly in a unique position, as as Jeannie mentioned in in introducing me. I'm an officer in the United States Army. And I was an aid worker in Kabul. And then the third key piece is that I am running for United States Congress. So the minute that I started seeing what was happening in Kabul, I started working my networks, whether it's my aid worker networks, just people I knew from my time working over in Afghanistan or my military networks. I was calling all my army buddies like, hey, do you know anyone on the ground? Do you know anyone on the Mm -hmm. ground? Just dialing and dialing and dialing and got in touch with some soldiers and also some Marines who were on the Mm -hmm. ground at the Kabul airport. And then my, my political networks, uh, Senator Tom Cotton actually was one of the major leaders in from Congress who was, they had a war room set up in his office. He had, he employed because he's a veteran himself. He hires a lot of veterans. So Mm -hmm. their office was just 24 hour full speed ahead operations to save people. And when I found out that I could get in contact with some soldiers through my networks on the ground and with some support from Senator Tom Cotton's office, I started calling Afghans that I knew and saying, look, it's not going to be the safest thing, but you've got to get to the airport. Mm -hmm. And if you can go to the gates and get to the front of the airport on the ground, we can work with some of the soldiers and send them your evacuation papers and your copies of your visa and pictures of what you look like, what you're wearing. And then we did all kinds of things. I mentioned it took WhatsApp to do all this. Yeah. We were always messaging like in in a WhatsApp chain saying like, okay, I have someone at this gate. They're, they're within 10 feet of the front of the, the crowd. Is there, are there soldiers that are able to, to run and extract them right now? And some of the soldiers in the group would be like, well, we're off in two hours. Can we do it in two hours? Like we'd be willing to run over to that gate and grab them. And, and then the, the Afghans on the ground would be taking pictures all around them. Like, okay, here's a tower that's close by. And here's, here's another identifying object. And they would send pictures in the group to show like exactly where they were at. And so one story that is really meaningful to me, uh, I have a friend who's already in the United States. She is a young Afghan woman who married an American. So she and her husband are here in the U.S. Mm -hmm. But her sister and her sister's husband were in danger in Kabul. And the husband had worked for the United States Army. He was an engineer and had helped working for the Army while they were there during the last two decades. So he was an SIV applicant uh, or an SIV visa holder. And they were desperate. So it's a, a mother and a father and two kids. And my friend from the U.S., the, the sister, called me and was like, Esther, my sister and her husband and their two kids, they're four and two, or maybe this family, I think they were six and four, excuse me. Uh, they have been in line for three days. They've just been waiting and waiting. They're finally up at the front of the crowd right next to a gate. Mm-hmm. But they're out of food. They're out of water. Is there anything you can do for them? Is there anything you can do? And I started reaching out to all my networks and being like, hey, I have a family. They're close to this gate. Can anyone help them? And the first, the first time, no luck. And then about 10 hours later, my friend reached out to me again and she's like, okay, they were in a desperate situation before. Now they are in a really desperate situation. So I reached out to all my network again. And this time, uh, there was a Marine that was able, he's like, you know what? I have a group of five guys. We're, we're available right now. So they started coordinating in a WhatsApp group and the, the wife spoke better English. So she was, she was in the WhatsApp group and telling the soldiers like, this is where we're at. And she shared the location, her, her geo tag location and like a live location sharing. So the soldiers could come and find the family and they, they got up right to the gate, but they were, or they got, excuse me, they got up right to the fence, but they were still about 10 feet away from the gate. And so they had to work their way just inch by inch through the crowd and push their way to the actual gate. And it took, it took like an hour and a half, 
two hours wow. for them to even just get 10 feet. Oh, my gosh. But they they kept at it. They worked hard. And so the, the extraction is going down. Like, everything is set. The soldiers are moving. They're on their way. And in that moment, the, the Afghan family's cell phone died. Can you imagine your entire life depending on if your and cell phone And you were about to charged? vouch for this family, right? Is that she yes. you don't yeah, vouch for him? Yeah. Well, and and it's not necessarily like me vouching, but what I was doing is they were sending me pictures of their passports, and I was filling out State Department forms, mm-hmm. and so they they were uh, they were a family that had all the correct documentation. It was just a matter of communicating of it, communicating it, and getting it to, in the hands of the right people, and then oh, finding a soldier who was able to come extract them at the right time. And so this family's cell phone died and the father was able to, they had shared the geotag location. So the soldiers were on their way to a specific location and the father was able to, with just his strength and hold his wife and his two kids in front of him, just hold on to the fence mm-hmm. so that the crowd couldn't push him out of where they were, where the soldiers were coming to. So thankfully, even though the family's phone died, the soldiers did come to the right location, the last shared location from um, the WhatsApp group, and the, they did get the family, and they were able to bring them into the airport. And once everyone got into the airport, it was visa processing and health checks, and it still took every family that got in. It still took them mm-hmm. about twenty-four to forty-eight hours before they even got on an airplane, <clears throat> just from the the processing in the airport. So there's a lot of reports, though, that, uh, you know, actually the majority of folks that came over on some of those planes, and in fact, all of them in in some cases, were not SIV eligible. (laughs) So how much confidence do you have that the system actually worked the way that it should in terms of, like, extracting from Afghanistan actual Afghanis who were in harm's way, who uh, helped the U.S. and deserved to come over here on evacuation flights? Jeannie, the way that the State Department ran the operations on the ground was a complete and utter chaotic failure. And it was an over it was an overwhelm of the system. They were unprepared. They should have been processing all these people months ahead of time mm-hmm. and they weren't doing that. Mm-hmm. And so the the influx the the uh, chaos emergency situation that was on the ground didn't allow for good operations and and they they made crit i would claim that the state department made critical mistakes like uh, i share this in in rahima's story that Mm -hmm. the state department outsourced visa checks to the taliban like this our state department our united states government was partnering with and working in conjunction with the enemy to process people to me that is just so inconceivable it's insane inappropriate I it cannot even insane. I can't really begin to wrap my head around that how the American government handed over basically put made Taliban a TSA. It yeah, and it I, to me it is. Mm-hmm. Uh, so uh, I mean, you, you well, we, we I mean, going forward, we've got multiple issues with this. I know my my two boys signed up to sort of vet and help do uh, a similar thing. Of course, you were working at a much higher level than them. Uh, in terms of, you know, coordinating the um, the evacuation of qualified people who did already mm-hmm. have their SIV documents in hand that, that just needed to get to the right location, needed to have that person on the other side, let them through the gate. And that, you know, once we left, though, uh, they were flat out told this program is completely shut down. So is, are you finding out that's the same thing? Do you have any, is there any effort at all that's being respected by private entities to um, help Afghanis in need escape that are authorized and should be is that or is that is it now has the State Department ple- completely taken over and the planes aren't flying anymore even private planes I'm told are not allowed to come and evacuate so is it's just you're at the behest of the the Taliban and the State Department to get out or is there any private efforts at all that are going to be uh, working there are private efforts still going on. Okay. Uh, a lot of them are very under the radar and as quiet as possible. Mm-hmm. As far as the State Department, they are actively preventing these private efforts from trying to help, which is, again, 
unconscionable. So I was just in a, a communication chain earlier today and hearing some of the feedback. Like the State Department is actively trying to prevent private efforts, but private efforts are trying to uh, find alternative routes where the State Department can't interfere and working with foreign countries besides the United States. So really this whole effort and everything that I've described is just it's citizens helping people, mm -hmm. people being mm -hmm. good people. A lot of them, yes, are former veterans, special operations uh, people. But so much of what's going on is just good people trying mm -hmm. to help save lives. And there is still some effort. I've heard that the Kabul airport is going to allow flights with with non-Afghans to exit the country, so only foreigners. So hopefully that will help some American citizens potentially uh, that are still stuck in, in Afghanistan. However, mm -hmm. for all the Afghans that their lives are in danger because they helped the United States, they are in desperate situations. Yeah. And I'm getting WhatsApp messages and emails on a daily basis of, hey, you helped my friend, can you help me please? They gave me your number please help me. I have this many kids and we're out of money because the economic system is shut down and we're in a desperate situation and Taliban knocked on our house and we escaped by the skin of our teeth and are staying at our uncle's house and we're in yeah. hiding and please help us. Get us, so, get us out of Afghanistan. It's so important that you continue to tell that story because I mean, Joe Biden's on TV calling this a success, said it went as planned. Anthony Blinken said there's no nothing really here. His team could have done differently. Um, what just to drive home the point, what is would it be like? What does Taliban rule mean to like a 15 year old oh. girl like the ones that you pulled out of there? Yeah it's guaranteed that they would have been taken and given to Afghan warriors, people that fought in the takeover of the country. They would have been given as prize brides, Ugh. very like automatically. They would have been immediately sold into a, a, some type of marriage and taken by force from their families and made to go to marry mm -hmm. someone that um, would have been brutal in all honesty, yeah. raping them on a regular basis. Okay, but so you're a JAG officer. I mean, uh, to me, it's just, it's unconscionable what the military allowed to happen, um, uh, personally. Uh, I have I have a problem with it. Uh, now you've got Blinken saying that the, that the Taliban is the de facto government of Afghanistan. These are our enemies. These were our sworn enemies. These were put on a terrorist watch list. Uh, and now these people are the ones that we have to negotiate with. Um, you know, it, it's just, un, and he, you know, and then Jake Sullivan being like coy and cute, he says it's hard to put a label on it when asked whether the Taliban are now a feminine, an adversary, or an enemy. I, it's just, it, it's unbelievable. On top of that, you've got a completely um, boneheaded mistake by these guys uh, taking out the wrong sort of ISIS K target right. that they mm -hmm. want, that they thought that they were, they had the right guy. Instead, they kill an innocent, actually, somebody who should have been ex extract, extracted from Afghanistan for help in the U.S. Instead, he was the one taken out by the U.S. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, 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 what are you hearing in your circles on this? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I want to preface any statement I make about the DOD as my personal opinion. Since I'm still active duty reservist, I have to put that disclaimer when I talk about of my course. personal opinions on the DOD. Uh, but... What I have found in talking with, with some of the the efforts that are going on still to rescue people is that there's just a, like a shell shock of like, where, where did the United States Department of Defense, where were they coming from on this? And I know that the, there are so many members of the military who are good and are motivated by good intention. And mm -hmm, we mm -hmm, saw that demonstrated at the airport. Mm -hmm. A lot of the soldiers that helped us, they helped us out of the kindness of their heart because they knew that these people would, would be in grave danger if they didn't get out of Afghanistan or if not um, killed. And so the people that, it was like the Wild West to a certain extent where the soldiers that were helping us did so out of goodness and not because they were ordered to or allowed to. So at the higher levels, um, just questioning, I, I'm not sure what's motivating our Department of Defense or mm -hmm. Department of State through this, but 
I think there's probably a lot of uh, vibrato from the White House saying like, this has been our foreign policy perspective and we're going to prove we're right, whether it costs lives or not. And to me, it is just, it's pride standing in the way of admitting, you know what, we made a mistake. We need to, we need to correct this and help people. Well, we applaud your efforts, and yeah. we hope to hear more from you uh, as you continue to to serve and to serve in a unique way. Um, God bless your work here, Esther Joy, um, getting these these Afghani's, um, rescuing them. It really to the is an possible. incredible story. If you mm -hmm. want to read it, it's on Barry Weiss's blog and her uh, and her podcast. You can... Okay, well, and go ahead. Oh, well, I was just going to say a huge thank you for letting me come and speak with you today and share the story. And there's still a lot of work to be done. As you highlighted, Jeannie, not everyone that's coming is, is safe for our country. So um, vetting them and making sure we're, we're doing things right on this on the immigration end is so critically important as well. Terrific. Well, God bless your work and, and all your efforts in, in this regard to keep our country safe. We really do appreciate it. Yep. Uh, our next segment is uh, continues on this same vein uh, where we're going to say the former chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Mike Mullen, on Sunday said there was absolutely there absolutely needs to be accountability for the botched Kabul drone strike that killed several mm -hmm. civilians. We're excited to talk about that next. This is an important topic, whether you're uh, in the suburbs of Chicago. Yep or serving on the front lines. People want answers and accountability with their government. So again, Esther Joy, thank you thank so much. You. Esther Joy King running for Congress, yeah. uh, hopefully in 17th. the 17th yeah. uh, Congressional District in Illinois. Uh, thank you so much and uh, have a great week. Thanks, Esther. Thanks and God bless.